Welcome back. This week we're going to be talking about consumer demographics and the relationship between demographics and the related signs of psychographics. We're also going to learn a little bit about how to conduct for free some kinds of data analysis on your consumers that most large corporations spend thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars on. There's a lot of hidden sources of consumer data out there, and this week we're going to learn more about how to find them in the readings. In this discussion, though, we're going to talk about consumer demographics and the role that they play in decision making, as well as how we form our attitudes about specific products. So when we talk about demographics versus psychographics, it's an important distinction. Demographics are fairly fixed traits of the consumer, such as their age, their gender, their identity as a member of a specific generation, their income, and where they're located geographically. Psychographics, on the other hand, are things like our attitudes, our personality, and those aspects of our identity that are more changeable. For instance, maybe somebody was a goth in high school, but now after college they have more of a corporate image. That's a changeable aspect of identity, and it's also an aspect of a consumer's psychographic profile. Their demographic profile, on the other hand, would be where they live, their age, and how much they're earning. Attitudes play a critical role in our psychographic profile. Consumers develop a range of attitudes towards products and even whole industries based on their past experiences, their social influences, including the influence of society around them as well as their friends and family, and the influence of those of us who are marketers. Our psychographics are also a part of our attitude. So how we identify determines our attitude towards a specific product. For instance, if we see ourselves as a green consumer, we're going to have a negative attitude towards a gas-guzzling SUV. Our attitudes are also formed by the type of decision that we're making about a product and about a purchase decision. So last week we talked about emotional versus practical inputs into the consumer decision-making process. There's also what are called the high involvement hierarchy, the low involvement hierarchy, and the experiential hierarchy. Now these are different sets of thoughts that we go through, as well as attitudes and beliefs, depending on the type of purchase and whether it's something that requires a lot of thinking and is a rational decision, whether it's an impulse buy, or whether it's a purchase that we're making simply to have an emotional experience. Now when we go back to last week and we think about how rational decision making for consumers, that's often what's called a high involvement hierarchy. Consumers have a set of core beliefs around a high ticket or a high involvement purchase such as higher education or a car or a dishwasher. We believe, for instance, that we want a good value, that um, green vehicles are better for the planet and more economical to own. That would be our beliefs. That influences our affect, or how we feel about a particular product, and then those beliefs, for instance, that we want a green vehicle because we want it to be environmentally friendly and cost less to run, makes us feel positive about a green vehicle such as, say, a Toyota Prius, and that causes the behavior of purchasing such a vehicle. The attitude that comes out of those beliefs that affect or set of feelings and that behavior is based on cognitive information processing, which means that we think about the process. Low involvement hierarchies, on the other hand, are impulse buys. We have a set of beliefs and that immediately leads to behavior. So our belief is that at three o'clock in the afternoon we wanna have a snack, that leads us to go out and purchase a candy bar, and then our affect is positive or negative based on whether we feel happier or better after eating that candy bar. Our attitudes in that sort of situation are based on behavioral learning processes, which can be basic stimulus and reward. In other words, if we eat a candy bar, we feel more energized, and then our attitude is that we like to eat candy bars. Then there's the experiential hierarchy. That starts with affect. 
that starts, in other words, with our emotions. We have an emotional need or emotional attitudes towards a particular product. For instance, maybe we really, really long for a Gucci handbag. That leads to the behavior, if we can afford it, of buying that Gucci handbag. And that solidifies our belief that that is a good kind of product to have. The attitude in that case is based on the principle of hedonic consumption or the attitude that we should be purchasing things or having experiences in order to make ourselves happy. So when we talk about a high involvement purchase, that comes from the conscious, rational part of our brains. If you're marketing a high involvement product or something that people form an attitude towards based on the high involvement hierarchy, you want to appeal to reason with facts about the product. For instance, let's say you're selling a raincoat that's high end, over $200, and it's an investment piece. You're going to want to appeal to people's reason if it's not a logical purchase and it's not an emotional purchase. Let's say it's not a luxury good, but something that really is a practical investment. You're going to want to say that it's waterproof, that it comes with a 20-year warranty, and that it's been lab tested because this is a high involvement purchase. And people forming a positive attitude towards your product is a high involvement process that involves cognitive learning, in other words, thinking and reasoning through in order to come to a decision and form an attitude. And you want it to appeal to people's rationality in that kind of case. Now, if you're talking about an experiential hierarchy, you want, people want that experience for the emotional benefit. And whether it's buying a $200 raincoat that's actually just a luxury item because it's Hermes, in which case you'd be lucky to get it for a couple thousand dollars, um, you want to emphasize the emotional impact of making that purchase, how good it's going to make people feel, how positive their energy is going to be afterwards. On the other hand, if you're dealing with the low involvement hierarchy, it's a low stakes impulse buy like a candy bar or a cup of coffee. Emotion is one of the key factors, but remember, people give these kinds of purchases very little thought and they want them to be efficient. So consumers are tapping into their emotions to make quick snap judgments about what flavor snack they're going to get, what kind of coffee they're going to get. But there's a reasoning aspect as well in order to appeal to people's sense of efficiency. So in other words, you want people to feel that they're making a quick purchase in a low involvement hierarchy situation because it's a low stakes impulse buy and they want to quickly conduct that purchase and get on with their lives. So you want to appeal to people's emotions, but you also want to appeal to people's rationality in a way that's completely different from an experiential purchase where people are purely making the purchase for that experience and to have that experience and you want to appeal purely to their emotions. So this is where personality starts to factor in because one person's emotional purchase that makes them happy is something that is of no interest to some other consumers. So personality has a lot of different factors according to psychologists that we as marketers of consumer products need to be aware of. One is that people have needs beyond just bare survival needs. And how those balance out in an individual are real factors in what goes into forming their personality. Some people have a high need for achievement, some people have a high need for affiliation or belonging, and some people have a high need for power. These are all really different personality types and what appeals emotionally to somebody with a high need for achievement is going to be very different than something that appeals to a person with a high need for affiliation or a high need for power. So let's go back to the example of that practical but expensive raincoat. Somebody with a high need for achievement would want to sh see the raincoat maybe in the context of people climbing a mountain. And you want to emphasize that if you own a raincoat like this, you'll be able to achieve your fitness goals faster because you can be out in all weathers. On the other hand, if you want to market to people with a high need for affiliation, you'll want to see the person who's wearing that raincoat hanging out with friends in a social setting, and you want to emphasize that the raincoat is a popular brand or look that will help people fit in with their peers, while at the same time perhaps also indicating that that raincoat will allow them to be out again with their friends and improve their ability to socialize with their outdoorsy friends. 
Now, on the other hand, if someone has a high need for power, what you want to emphasize in an ad for that particular style of raincoat would be that if they wear that raincoat, they're going to be influential among their friends because it's cutting edge and trendy, or they could win, for instance, say a Tough mutter race if they had a coat like this. Another way in which people's personalities vary is their actual versus ideal self. We all know that we have an ideal self, and in the age of social media, that's often the person we are presenting on Facebook or Instagram. That ideal self may be the person we are when we're really having a great day and we've achieved our personal best in fitness. Sometimes we achieve that ideal self with the help of a couple of filters, but that is the image of who we really aspire to be. The role of fashion and consumer goods is shaping and realizing the ideal self in many cases. You might buy a specific line of cosmetics to look like your ideal self, more polished or professional. You might buy fitness equipment to become stronger and healthier. Or you might buy that green vehicle in order to meet that ideal you have of yourself, of somebody who helps out the environment. So in other words, Consumer goods often are a way that people help meet that ideal self and improve their actual selves. Then there's the self-concept of multiple selves. People place a lot of importance of shopping where you feel your personality resonates. There's people who really want to shop at REI because they see themselves as rugged or outdoorsy and who would feel uncomfortable in Lord & Taylor, for instance. So that self-image, that self-concept, moving away from the difference between your actual and ideal self, but that real message of who you think you really are in terms of your outlook on life, you want to make sure that when you're marketing consumer goods, you identify what kind of person you are trying to reach out towards and align with that self-concept. Now, we often have multiple selves. Maybe at work you see yourself as a business-like person who's efficient and makes smart decisions. At the same time, in your personal life, you may see yourself as a caring friend and family member. You might shop at multiple different companies that align with the different self-concepts you have. So, for instance, you might go into Staples because it aligns with your business self-concept of an efficient person. And you might shop at, say, the paper store uh, because it aligns with your self-concept of being a caring family member where you pick up greeting cards and candles and things to make your home more pleasant. So that's a quick overview of psychographics. Now let's talk a little bit more about demographics because even though they are sometimes less important than psychographics, they still play a really important role in people's purchases. So demographics are where people would traditionally target their consumers. Demographics are people's age, their income or wealth, or their marital status. And when you look at traditional marketing, this was how marketers broke people down. They stereotyped people of a certain age, for instance, thinking that everybody 18 to 24 was maybe in college, was carefree, and that quote unquote younger audiences only wanted particular types of product. We've been moving beyond pure demographics much more quickly in the past few years because with great data that we can collect on consumers from Facebook and data warehouses aimed at consumer marketers, we can see exactly what people's tastes and preferences are instead of trying to guess them based on their age or zip code. We also have come to have a fuller realization of how varied and diverse consumers are. And pure demographics are becoming less and less relevant. If you look out there in the marketplace, you can see that there are male beauty influencers as we move past the stereotype that only women are interested in beauty products. Fast fashion helps people be trendy at all price ranges, so when you think about trendy designers or the latest looks, people no longer stereotype those sorts of things as being the province of the wealthy. We have people living their lives at different paces, maybe becoming parents earlier in life and going to school later in life. And yet people want a particular lifestyle. People might get married long before they buy a house instead of getting married and buying a house immediately. They might go to grad school before they do any of these things. And so people live their lives in a different and more flexible order than they might have done two or three generations ago. 
By the same token, however, there are still demographics that matter. For instance, if you're 22 years old, you're probably not thinking about retirement plans. At the same time, if you're 55, you definitely are thinking about retirement plans. So certain products really do make sense to target to people based on their age or their income level. Certainly, most of us cannot afford certain luxury goods simply based on our income level. So when you think about targeting people by demographics, you want to avoid the stereotypes of the past. That's a trap that marketers used to fall into, and it led to reinforcing Im images about gender or age that really have never held true and hold true less and less. However, at the same time, there are certain products that really only make sense to market to people because they are age-based, and in those cases it makes sense, as well as certain things that only work for people of certain income levels. So where do you get both demographic and psychographic data? Well, actually, um, your taxpayer dollars have already paid for a huge amount of research conducted by the government itself. People often think of the census as simply being a count of U.S. citizens based on their zip codes and maybe their age and gender and um, maybe ethnicity, but at the same time, they don't realize that the census traditionally also collects a lot of data about people's lifestyle choices. And in fact, that data is very rich and robust if you look at some immediate past censuses. Whether you're looking at how many um, bedrooms there are in the typical house in a specific zip code to how many years of education people have had in a specific zip code, the census data at census.gov actually carries a lot of that information. Also, sometimes there are research reports from major firms that are made available to the public in exchange for giving your email address or other contact information. Research is really a gold mine if you know where to dig. Every once in a while, trade publications such as publications put out by the American Marketing Association or the Direct Marketing Association are useful. But even more useful are the research reports put out by specific trade associations or professional associations. Yeah, whether you're an electrical engineer or a veterinarian, there's a trade association out there for you. And many of these associations actually survey their members and ask them questions about what their buying habits are. They'll also ask them about their income levels and where they live. That kind of information is extremely useful if you are trying to market to people in those specific professions. So don't overlook that demographic and psychographic data that you can get from trade associations. Research is all over the place. So you can look in the readings for this week as well as research your specific target audience across the web and you'll find some great data on pretty much any audience that you want to target. So I really hope that you enjoyed this week's review of research and psychographics and demographics. I do want to do a quick review. Take a look at census.gov and take a look in the readings at the other sources of data. You're going to find a wealth of data both on people's demographics, but also you want to think beyond that to their psychographics, to their attitudes and viewpoints and how those influence the why of the buy for specific consumers with different attitudes, different needs, and different um, appeals for your products.